So hi everyone, we'll be talking about the current resistance and EMF part one for this lecture. And uh, this is an introduction to the concepts or the parts that you will be encountering when we talk about uh, direct current circuits and uh, alternate current cir circuits. So it's uh, important for you to understand the concepts in this chapter for you to understand that. And in order for you to understand the concepts in this uh, chapter, you have to review the previous lectures if you have uh, forgotten them. Okay, so the picture here is an example of a circuit that is um, that has a series of logic gates, but um, I'm not sure there's no label as to what type of a uh, logic circuit is so I can't specifically say which one and it also has an LED diode and a resistor and a switch so these are all components that you will find if you uh, will have an electronics lab course and but I will be giving um, an example for that I, I found a simulator where you can do all of these um, in your computer. Okay, so lecture objectives. So we will know the meaning of an electric current, how a charge it, how charges move in a conductor. So last time we talked about electrostatics. So the charges are stationary. They they weren't moving yet, but this time they are. And um, we will examine how the forces are different when it comes to electrodynamics versus electrostatics. And then uh, you will be learning what is meant by the resistivity and conductivity of a substance, how to calculate the resistance of conductor from its dimensions and resistivity, how an electromotive force or EMF makes it possible for current to flow in a circuit, um, how to do calculations involving energy and power in circuits. And lastly, how to use a simple model to understand the flow of current in material. So the last two bullet points will be a separate video since they also have uh, lengthy explanations, which I think might be too heavy for one lecture. So um, the, the first four bullet points will be the topic for this specific um, part of the video. Okay. So for the again for the past four chapters, we have talked about the electric charge, the electric force, Gauss's law, and electrostatics, um, the electric potential, and the capac capacitance and dielectrics between two plates. So all of them were discussed with the initial thought that the electric field inside the conductor is zero and the excess charges remain on the surface of the conductor. So remember in uh, Gauss's law, we were able to establish this fact for um, electrostatics. But this time we will study what happens when there is an electric field inside the conductor. So first we have to discuss the moving, uh, the, sorry, the movement of charges from one part to another part. And that is what we call the current. So in this video, I will constantly refer to current as water molecules flowing in a river, like in the, the GIF here on the, the left side. But um, instead of it merging with a different body of water, it stays in a constant loop, which we will call a circuit. So you can imagine a circuit like the race circuit on the right from the game Mario Kart. So this is what charges look like when they move from one point in the circuit to another. So if there's no circuit, as we will see later, no current will be produced, okay? So first let's, let's discuss the differences in electrostatics and electrodynamics inside a conductor. So 
In electrostatics, there is no electric field present inside the conductors, like uh, I said a while ago. So this means that the electrons do not experience an uh, external force. But in electrodynamics, an electric field is present. So this means that the electron is subjected to that external force, F equals QE. So we've already encountered this equation in the first chapter of the course. So because there is no external force on the free electrons, they tend to move randomly like gas molecules. Um, so this means that there is no net flow of movement, movement of charges. The net current is then zero. So why is there no current? Because the movement of the electrons is random. They don't have a specific path of movement unlike um, let's say in electrodynamics because then they are subjected to an electric field. So if let's say it's a constant electric field, the charges would have a constant acceleration. And if it's in vacuum and it's the only particle there, okay? So, uh, so for example, in a conductor, there are multiple particles inside. So that moving electron will collide with a stationary particle. So what I'm saying here is that in electrodynamics in vacuum, so that's, the, uh, that's where you know that the, in, the charges movement is influenced by an electric field, which causes it to move. But let's say that there is um, another particle that is present in that material. Like for example, if it's in a wire, that means it's impossible for it not to hit anything. So it's um, so that um, that collision has an effect on the movement of the particle and also the energy transferred uh, of uh, for from the particle. So if you look at the image on the right, you'll see that while yes, both of them have random paths, the conductor with an uh, internal electric field has another factor that changes its path after collision. So that's what I was saying a while ago. And um, this change is what you call the drift velocity. So it is a very slow net motion of the moving charged particle. So it's because of this drift velocity that there is an impact on the movement of the electron. So meaning that there is a net current in the conductor. Okay, so I, I, uh, I have this, I have this um, example. So let's say we have a flashlight. If there is a delay due to this collision producing a drift velocity, how come the light appears instantaneously or at the speed of light when you switch on the, fly, the flashlight? So this is because in a wire, all of the electrons are subjected to the same electric field at the same time. So this means that the closer to the light, um, uh, it so sorry. So this means that the electrons that are closer to the light carries energy to the bulb. So um, what does this mean? When we talk about the movement of electrons in a conductor, we don't just look at one individual electron, but as a collection of electrons in a wire. So one good analogy is how an army moves, uh, for example, the one in uh, Lord of the Rings or, for example, Game of Thrones, they don't have the technology to send a signal to each soldier to move. But because one of them moves, the others will follow. So when you think of the current, I hope this is what um, comes to mind. And I hope that this uh, clears things up because it is hard to visualize. So, so now, uh, that we have talked about the difference of electrostatics and electrodynamics 
and we also discussed what the current is and we also have a visual uh, uh, an analogous visual representation of what the current is uh, now let's examine what the electric field really does to the charges because without it the free electrons would still have movement in random patterns so we can imagine the drifting of charges as work and energy so this means that the atoms inside the conductor vibrates as an electric field is applied so because energy is transferred through the collisions as we also remember from thermodynamics that when an atom is excited meaning it gains a high amount of energy from the collisions that produces heat. So it is important to note that while the electric field does help in moving the electrons, it is usually um, providing more energy for raising the temperature, the temperature than it does in increasing the current. So more energy for the temperature than increasing the current. So where can you see this um, phenomenon occurring? One good application of this effect is the heating element from barbecue grills or toasters or even the rotisserie oven. And you can see it has this orangish glow as shown in the image here. But this effect also has its downsides. So one of the problems in circuits is that the heat it produces um it uh so because it produces heat sorry uh this means that there is more energy transferred into heat than it does for the movement of electrons so this means that for example if your phone heats up or your laptop gets um hot it slows down so just a simple reminder that we are in a tropical country just remember that uh, this contributes to the degradation of your gadgets spe specifically your batteries so uh, make sure that your gadgets don't heat up so much and have proper ventilation so um, this uh, relationship between current and temperature is why that's important now to discuss about what carries current, we, we have here different current carrying materials. So first we have the metals, uh, which are all negative uh, charged particles, which are the electrons. And we have ionized gas or ionic solutions, which is a mix of positive and negative charges. For example, for ion, an ionic solution, we have sodium chloride in water, which has uh, sodium, uh, uh, sodium cation and chloride anions. Lastly, we have semiconductors, uh, which have charged particles uh, called electrons, and the other one is a hole, which I will explain in, in a bit. All right, so, so what is a semiconductor first? So it's much more tricky because uh, a semiconductor isn't one homogeneous material, unlike the, the metals or the solution that's fully um, immersed or, or mixed in, in, the, in water, for example. Uh, like, for example, if sodium chloride is completely dissolved, that uh, it already completed uh, the reaction that it's just an ionic solution. Okay, so the, the semiconductor isn't like that. So it has a, uh, these uh, semiconductors are usually made up of a P and an N semiconductor as shown on the image on the right. And these two ma different materials are fabricated on top of each other, usually by film coating or uh, there's a method called epitaxy um, but one of uh, one cool thing about them is that these semiconductors are not um, pure materials because they're actually doped with impurities that make them more positive or more negative so the doping um, process also changes other parts of the the material aside from adding 
um, electrons and um, removing electrons. So there, there are more uses for, for doping them. But in this case, it's to make one side more negative and the other side more positive. Okay, so with the positive, uh, positive side, as you would guess, sorry, is the P semiconductor, uh, which is removed of electrons again, as I said before. Uh, while the negative side is the N semiconductor, which is added um, some electrons. So, um, so for it to conduct, uh, for for it to conduct electricity or for it to have a current passing through it. Um, the only time uh, it happens is when it reaches a specific energy level uh, that the negative charges are transferred from the N semiconductor to the P semiconductor. And the holes, which are now considered as um, positive charges, for example, transfer to the N part of the semiconductor. So um, this means that the current only flows in one way in a semiconductor. So I'll show you later why um, this is. Uh, we will be having graphs about the, the voltage and current for and the resistivity for that one. So um, we'll get back to this. But for now, uh, these are the three types of current carrying materials. And so I hope this one is clear. Now let's discuss the, the direction of current flow. So uh, let's assess what this means for the drift velocity, because we already know that some of it carries all positive, some of it carries all negative, some of it carries both positive and negative. So um, what, what does this mean for the drift velocity? Because uh, in, yeah, in the two images above, Let's recall what we learned in the first chapter, which was on electric charges and the electric field. So when a charge is subjected to a uniform electric field, the movement of a positive charge is in the same direction as the electric field, while a negative charge moves in the opposite direction of the electric field. So if you still feel confused about this, feel free to check out the other lectures or send me a message. So now going back to the images. So because the negative charges are moving against the electric field, this means that the positive charges left in the material will move in the direction of the electric field. So this means uh, that we can say the direction of current flow is always in the direction of positive charges. So this is what we call a conventional current. And this means that the sign of the charges is irrelevant in determining the current. But I also want you to keep in mind that just because the current is always in the direction of positive charges, that it automatically means that there is, uh, that that is the actual direction of the charge is moving. So that part is still different. So it's only the current's direction. But if you look at the charges inside it, it's still possible for it to move in an opposite direction to the um, electric field. So for us to understand this further, let's look at the image on the right. So you have a battery connected to a light bulb through a wire, and we see a cross section of that wire. So remember, we talked about fluid flow when we discussed the flux in our Gauss's law lecture. So let's look at it in the same way and see how to quantify the amount of charges passing through the cross section over a specific period of time. So we define that now as dq over dt. So this is our definition of what a current is. It's the net charge flowing through the area per unit time. So what's the unit for a current? It's called an ampere and it's equivalent to one coulomb 
per second. Now, how do we relate the current and the drift velocity? First, let's see how we can get the amount of charges passing through the area over time. So let's go back to the image on the right, as we have seen earlier. And we know that there is an n amount of charges passing through the area. So we define that as the concentration of the particles. We also know that these charges have a specific drift velocity it brings along with it. This means that for one charge moving in a time interval, distance it takes is given by Vd dt, where Vd is the drift velocity. So think of it as a thin cylinder. So the width of that disk is the distance it takes for the charge to move at a time interval, and then multiply that with the area to get the volume of the cylinder, giving you AVD dt. So that is just for one charged particle. So for a concentration of particles, we just multiply it by n. This means that we can have an equation for the current that relates it to the drift velocity, which is I equals nq vd a. So the equation here for current is a general equation because it's applicable for both positive and negative charges given by the absolute value symbol. So now that we talked about charge densities before, when we talked about the electric field or the flux in a ring of charge, a disk or a line of charge, and there we learned about the linear charge density, the surface charge density, and the volume charge density. So this time, it is also possible to know the current per cross-sectional area. And we will now define that as the current density. We can even write it in terms of the vector form of the drift velocity as j equals nqvd. So how come in this case, the current density has a direction, but the current doesn't? Well, it's because the current density is a measure of the flow of charges at a specific point, um, which is the cross-sectional area. Whereas the current measures the flow at all points in the object, like for example, the current in a wire. So again, the current density is just the, uh, the, the flow of charge at a specific cross-sectional area. Well, whereas the current is the uh, the flow at all points in uh, the circuit. So we keep mentioning that wires that, uh, yeah, we keep mentioning wires have uh, the same charges and concentrations. But what if it's a mixed current carrying material, like the, the ionic solutions? So, for example, if you dissolve uh, sodium chloride in water, which creates sodium cation and chloride ion anion. Um, they will have different charges and different drift velocities. So this means that to get the total current, you have to add the currents from those different groups. And the same way happens when it comes uh, to that current density. So we will see more of this current and current density when we move on to magnetism. So it's important that you understand how it works and the difference between them. So one example problem here of getting the current density and the drift velocity in a wire. So we have an 18 gauge copper wire, which is the size usually used for lamp cords has a nominal diameter of 1.02 millimeters. This wire carries a constant current of 1.67 uh, amperes to a 200 watt lamp. The density of free electrons is 8.85 times 10 to the 28 electrons per cubic meter, find the magnitude of the current density. So one thing that I haven't mentioned is the meaning of what an 18 gauge um, copper wire um, it is uh, equivalent to. So the, the gauge means the amount of current a wire can carry based on the thickness of the wire. 
So I think a smaller gauge means that uh, the the current is better. But uh, I will have to check again uh, regarding what, what that means. Anyway, going back to our um, calculations, to find the current density, we know that it's given by the current per area, per cross-sectional area. So uh, to get that first, we have to get the cross-sectional area of the wire, which is given by pi r squared, where we're only given the diameter. So that means um, the, the radius is d over 2, which is the diameter divided by 2, which we will have pi d squared over 4. So putting our value for the diameter here, we have a cross-sectional area of 8.17 times 10 to the negative 7 meters squared. So that's the cross-sectional area of the wire, which we can just um, plug in our equation for the current density. So uh, we already have our current well, So our current density is 2.04 times 10 to the 6 uh, amperes per meter squared. So this time, we will be looking for the drift velocity. So we know that J is equal to NQVD. So rearranging that equation, we get the equation for the drift velocity, which is VD equals J over NQ. And we know that we have electrons, so the absolute value um, uh, makes it, removes that um, sign. So our drift velocity is 1.5 times 10 to the negative 4 meters per second. OK, so to test your understanding, suppose we replace the wire in the example with a 12-gauge copper wire, which has twice the diameter of an 18-gauge wire. If the current remains the same, what effect would this have on the magnitude of the drift velocity? So if, uh, if you want to answer it, can we pause the, the video? And then um, once you get back, I'll explain uh, the answer. OK, so if you pause it and you have an answer, so the answer is the drift velocity would be one fourth as great. So in this case, the drift velocity um, would be one fourth as great. Why? Because the diameter of the wire increases meaning the area of the wire increases four times greater, given our equation earlier. Yeah, so relating the current and the drift velocity, we know that the area is inversely proportional to the drift velocity. So now let's talk about resistivity. So we've learned about the current density in the last few slides. And we were able to get the equation for it as J equals NQVD, where VD is the drift velocity. And we also know that the drift velocity is also influenced by the strength of the electric field. This means that the current density is dependent on the electric field and another property of materials. So what other properties? How do we account for each of them? That seems a bit complicated to talk about right now because it delves into topics in solid state physics. So for now, we will deal with a general form of Ohm's law or an idealized model. And this applies for metals and some materials. Um, it states that at a given temperature, the current density J is nearly directly proportional to E and the ratio of the magnitudes of E and J is constant. So if you get the ratio E over J, this means that the bigger the resistivity, you will need a stronger electric field to reach a certain current density. Or on the other hand, you can also state that the bigger the resistivity, the smaller the current density caused by the electric field. So um, that's what the resistivity is. So what's the uh, unit for the, the, the resistivity? It's given by one ohm meter. So we have introduced yet another unit called an ohm, which is just um, one volt 
per ampere. Um, so we will know later why one ohm is equal to one volt per ampere. But for now, the unit for resistivity is one ohm meter. So, um, so now, what if you get the reciprocal of the resistivity? So the ratio of the charge density and the electric field will be given by J over E. And this is denoted now as the conductivity of the material. So another thing that I want to introduce as well is the concept of ohmic and non-ohmic uh, materials. So an ohmic material is one that obeys Ohm's law, which is also known as a linear conductor, which we will uh, see why it's called linear later. And then we also have non-ohmic uh, materials. So this one, uh, the current density depends on the electric field in a more complicated manner. So this is also known as nonlinear. So again, um, this one, the reason for it being uh, complicated is due to um, concepts that is found in solid state physics. And um, it also has applications uh, from the, the results of, of quantum mechanics. So uh, now in the table, here we see a list of materials and their respective resistivities at room temperature. So as you can see, insulators have the highest resistivities while the metals have the lowest resistivities. So this means that the metals have much larger conductivities compared to insulators. So you can actually think of conductivity here as something similar to the thermal conductivity that you have studied in thermodynamics. And it is also important to note that a material with high conductivity also constitutes a property of high thermal conductivity. So for example, metals. One thing I want you to try at home, if you make a hot coffee or tea, try to compare the time it takes for it to cool down with and without a spoon. Um, and then uh, if you can maybe share with me uh, your results. Anyway, the image on the left shows something peculiar, right? So how come they're so close together? So the, the image on the right has conducting paths, which are, um, I think, made from conductive ink. And so th these are called traces. So if they're so close together, won't the electric fields interfere with the movement of the other conductive coatings in the circuit board? Well, the board that is uh, that it is coated on is also not just any kind of plastic, but it was specifically chosen to have a high resistivity. So therefore, it has a very low conductivity, which means that current can't flow in between. In short, the high resistivity of the material or the board uh, prevents the uh, prevents short circuits to happen. So what about the in-between? So uh, we already talked about metals and insulators, which are um, on opposite ends. So the semiconductors, these materials, their res resistivities are uh, literally between the range for insulators and conductors. So this is why semiconductors are useful in modern technology, because now they can be um, more smaller, um, compact, and most of all, uh, thermally stable. So speaking of the relationship between resistivity and temperature, we have here three plots for a metal, a semiconductor, and a superconductor. So first, let's look at the metal. We see that the higher the resistivity, the higher the temperature. So this is because the charges in the conductor will bump into more particles, which impedes the drift velocity, and then it will reduce the current. But for semiconductors and some non-metals, such as graphite, the res resistivity is higher at lower temperatures and lower at higher temperature. So there is a material called a thermistor. And because of its sensitivity to temperature in a circuit, 
when its resistance goes higher or lower is correlated to a specific um, temperature. So this is um, this is what you call a sensor. So uh, if you have any projects that involves um, temperature changes, a thermistor is good to use. Or there's also another one, uh, another component called an LM35, uh, which also works as a thermistor. But it's uh, it's different. So lastly, we have a another peculiar looking graph here for a superconductor. So as you can see, after the superconductor is cooled to a specific uh, critical temperature, which we label here as TC, the resistivity becomes zero. So this is one of the unanswered questions in physics. They still don't know what's the reason behind superconductivity. And also, they're also still trying to figure out how, if it's possible to increase that critical temperature to room temperature. So, you know, who knows? Maybe you will be the one to figure that out. Okay. So here again, we have a table for the resistivity and uh, the coefficient of resistivity. So this one is also at room temperature. So one thing I also want to, so this uh, coefficient will be useful later also when we calculate for the, the resistance at a specific temperature as well. So uh, keep this table in mind. And I also want to share a biology application for resist resistivity because we keep having um, examples for electronic stuff, but this is actually also applicable to the nervous system. So um, for nerve conduction. So remember in the capacitance, we talked about accents. So in here, the myelin is wrapped around the axon, which is, so the axon is a conductive material. So the axon is used as a pathway for electrical signals to pass through the nerves. So since the myelin has a higher resistivity than the axon, the electric signals remain in the axon. So these signals are traveling much faster than it would if there was no myelin present. Okay, so that is uh, one cool um, application or example of uh, how the resistivity uh, the, the resistivity of the material helps in uh, conduction of electricity. So to test your understanding again, you maintain a constant electric field inside a piece of semiconductor while lowering the semiconductor's temperature. So what happens to the current density in the semiconductor? Okay, so the answer here is that it decreases so the current density should decrease because the resistivity will increase when the semiconductor is full. Okay, so I hope that uh, you understand this one. So we discussed already what the current means, what current density is, and um, we also discussed the property of uh, materials, which is the resistivity and their conductivity, which affects the uh, the flow of current inside the material, or or not uh, have any electric fields um, or current, sorry, flowing through that material due to the resistivity. So now we will uh, have another material that uh, we will be discussing, which is the resistance of a material, sorry, another property of the material, which is the resistance. So at the start of the lecture, we connected the current with the water flowing in the river. So let's say the river has beavers and they're building a dam. The reason for this is to slow down the flow of water and to protect them, the, them from other wildlife. But first let's focus on uh, more on the slowing down of the flow of water. 
So we can imagine that circuit, circuits also have a dam that helps slow down the flow of charges. And this material is what we, uh, is what we call a resistor. And the property that it has is called the resistance. So how do we find the resistance of an object? So we have a relationship between the electric field and the current density um, and the resistivity from our previous slides. And we can then rewrite that as E equals raw J, where raw is the resistivity of the material. So this is just for a specific portion of the material though. We want to look into the whole picture, the whole uh, circuit. So this means that instead of the current density, we will look into the current I, and instead of just the electric field, we will look into the potential difference from one point to another in the circuit, which is the voltage. So in an experimental setup, this is also good because it's easier to measure the current and the voltage. Now, how do we equate the voltage, the current, and the, resist the resistance together? So let's go back to examining a wire as shown in the figure on the right. Let's imagine again a cross-sectional area and length L. We will assume that the voltage is positive since we will be getting the potential difference from a higher potential to the lower potential. And we also know that the direction of the current is always in the direction of the positive charges, hence the higher potential. So if you're still confused with this one, go back to the first part of this video where we discuss about the current flow. So remember when we discussed the electric potential V equals integral of the dot product of E and DL, or V is equal to EL, we, uh, then we also found that the current density is equal to the current over the area. So replacing the electric field and the current density with the equivalent variables in terms of the voltage and the current, we get V over L is equal to the resistivity over uh, resistivity times the length over the area, where V is equal to the resistivity uh, times the length times the uh, current over the area. So we can then say that the, the resistivity times the length over A is equivalent to the resistance. And now we have Ohm's law in terms of the voltage, current, and resistance, which is the famous V equals IR, Ohm's law, which is, uh, so now we have related the voltage, the current, and the resistance. But one thing, that I want you to remember though, that Ohm's law is an idealized model that states the ratio between the electric field and the current density. So this has to be constant. This means that the resistance should also be constant as V over I is constant in order for V equals IR to be acceptable as Ohm's law. So this is a special case only, uh, the theory uh, for this is much more complicated, which we will explain in um, the next bit. So again, uh, V equals IR is only applicable for, um, for a resistance that is constant. So now we get to the fun part. In electronics, we introduced uh, what a capacitor looks like. So now let's introduce another component and that is called the resistor. So the resistor has a wide variety of values and they have color coded bands on them. So each of the bands have a specific color dedicated to that specific value. So how do we interpret it? As you can see in the image above, a typical resistor has four bands. The drawing is actually a bit confusing because you don't really see that the tolerance band has a metallic paint in gold or silver, depending on the percentage of the tolerance. But let's look at the actual resistor below. 
So you start with the side that doesn't have the metallic paint. And then we have a table here that shows the color codes for resistors. So there's black, brown, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, gray, and white. It has a value as a digit and a value as a multiplier. And that will be used as your first, uh, second, and uh, the multiplier. Okay, so uh, here we know that the, the first band from um, opposite the tolerance band is the first digit. The next one after that is the second digit. Uh, the multiplier is the third one uh, next to the tolerance. Sometimes there is also a fourth one. I'm not sure if um, I have an example here. But anyway, so let's see uh, what the value is for this, uh, this band. And how did we get 470 k uh, kilo ohms? So the yellow band should be the first digit. And according to the table, yellow is equal to four. And then the second digit is um, violet, which we know as seven. And the third one is orange, which means the multiplier is 10 raised to the third power. So that means, um, so that means your, yeah, that means your resistor is um, 470 kilo ohms. Oh, sorry, this is a typo. It should be 47 kilo ohms. I was wondering about the extra zero there. So this is a typo. This is just 47 kilo ohms. Okay. All right. So again, the gold band means that it has a, a plus or minus 5% tolerance. A uh, silver band means that there's a plus minus 10% tolerance and no band means there's a plus minus 20% tolerance. So the tolerance meaning uh, means the accuracy of the value uh, that's written on the resistor or that uh, the bands are equivalent to. So the tolerance that. Okay, so, oh, sorry, I already revealed it, but Okay, so I have here five uh, resistors, and I want you to pause this video and try to figure out the values of the resistors on your own. And then after you pause it, I'll reveal the answers. Okay, so if you paused it, I hope you did. Uh, the answers are as follows. The first one is uh, 39 kilo ohms. Second one is 47 ohms. Third one is 1,500 ohms. Um, the next one is 100 ohms. And the last one is 2,200 ohms. Okay. So if you're buying components also online, you can, if you, you're not sure about the value that you computed yourself, you can always Google the specific value of the resistor to check if the, the sequence of bands is correct. Just, that's just like, a, a simple trick to, to make sure. And uh, you might have looked at the color differently or if you, yeah. Okay, so when we started, uh, when we start, sorry, we start discussing circuits, uh, there are two types. As I've mentioned in uh, the first part of our slides, uh, the direct current and the alternating current. So, uh, an ohmic resistor is applicable for direct current where the current increases as the voltage increases. So in other words, they have a linear relationship. On the other hand, if we talk about the alternating current here, we have a semiconductor diode as an example of a non-ohmic resistor. So we already defined what an ohmic and a non-ohmic resistor is. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the only time it produces a current is when the voltage is positive. If it's negative, the current is zero. So remember when we discussed charge carriers, we mentioned that semiconductors have a PN junction. And the benefits of that is for unidirectional applications and 
this is why. So also this will be important when we talk about alternating currents and there are a number of logic kits that can uh, be done with this property. But um, another thing that I want to add about semiconductor diodes. So for example, you have an LED diode. So the, it's important that you follow the direction of um, the, the positive side because if you connect it in the opposite direction, that will um, destroy your light emitting diode or your LED. Okay, so for semiconductors, it's important that you connect it the right way or else uh, you will destroy it. So let's have an example here, an electric field, potential difference and resistance in a wire. So again, we have our 18 gauge copper wire, which has a diameter of 1.02 millimeters and a cross-sectional area of 8.2 times 10 to the negative se uh, seven meters squared. And it carries a current of 1.67 uh, amperes. We have defined the electric field magnitude in the wire. So we know when we discussed Ohm's law is that the resistivity is equal to E over J. And rearranging that, that equation, we get E is equal to the resistivity times the current density. We also know that the resistivity of a copper wire from our table earlier, uh, so you can just go back to that, use our slides, 1.72 times 10 to the negative 8 ohm meters is the resistivity of copper wire. So we also know that the current density is just given by the current over the cross-sectional area. And we also know that the cross-sectional area is already uh, given here. So we just plug in all of those values. So our electric field magnitude is 0 0.035 volts per meter. So our equations, um, our units are also correct, as I've shown here on the right, because one ampere is equal to one coulomb per second, and one ohm is just equal to one volt per ampere, which is equal to volt seconds per coulomb. Okay, so you will be left with just volts per meter when you um, you substitute these equivalent units. Next, the same problem, but this time we have to find the potential difference between the two points in the wire five meters apart. So uh, the potential difference, as we've known before, is equal to EL. And you're given, we already solved for E, and we already know L, plugging in the values, the potential difference between the two points in the wire is 1.75 volts. So third question, uh, we have to find the resistance of a 50 meter length um, of this wire. So we know that from the idealized, idealized model of Ohm's law, V is equal to IR, where R is equal to V over I, if you rearrange the equation, plugging in the values that we got for current and we already have, um, oh, sorry, our potential difference calculation and the given current, uh, we get a resistance of 1.05 ohms. Okay, now we have another question here regarding the temperature dependence of resistance. So suppose the resistance of the wire is 1.05 ohms at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. Find the resistance at zero degrees Celsius and at 100 degrees Celsius. So we are, we're already introduced to this equation for resistivity um, and how to get the resistivity at, at a specific temperature. So uh, this is uh, the equation for the resistance is similar to that. So we just replace the raw with R. And so the dependence is just the same. So uh, we know that R0 is 1.05 ohms, and the temperature for that is 20, uh, 20 degrees Celsius. Our alpha, uh, which is the coefficient of resistivity, as we have uh, shown in uh, a previous slide. So I'll go back to that way. So it's from here, coefficients of resistivity, and we're looking at copper. Okay, so 0 0.00393. Okay, here. Okay, so this is our value. 
and we have uh, 20 degrees Celsius for our initial, and our T1 is zero degrees Celsius, T2 is 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so to get R1, which is at zero degrees Celsius, we just input the value, the initial resistance, plus one plus the coefficient, um, plus the um, times the, the difference, uh, the change in temperature, which is just zero minus 20, so that's negative 20. And so your resistance at zero degrees is 0 0.97 ohms. And then here at 100 degrees, you have 1.05 is the initial resistance, and then uh, the coefficient of resi resistivity, 100 minus 20 degrees, and you get a resistance of 1.38 ohms at 100 degrees Celsius. So as you can see, again, as the temperature is higher, the resistance also increases. And as the temperature is lower, the resistance is lower, okay? So to test your understanding of what we just discussed, suppose you increase the voltage across the copper wire in the previous examples. The increase in the voltage causes more current to flow, which makes the temperature of the wire increase. So the same thing happens to the coils of an electric oven or a toaster when a voltage is applied to them. If you double the voltage across the wire, the current in the wire also increases. By what factor does it increase? Okay, so this one is a tricky question because um, while the, the voltage uh, and the current increases, the resistivity increases as, uh, as well. So this means that the, 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 this means that the current will decrease by less than two because I is equal, uh, is equal to V over R. So if the resistance also increases, then that means, um, yeah, then that means the resist, uh, the current will decrease by uh, less than two, okay? So going back to our analogies for water, let's now discuss the electromotive force. Okay, so what is an electromotive force? Let's say you happen to go to this wonderful airport in Singapore. I've personally never been there, but there is this amazing waterfall thing that they have on display. So have you ever wondered what pushes the water up the pipes? Well, it has a water pump that pumps it from a lower level to a higher level by, um, by uh, building up. You can see that in the figure on the lower left, there is an impeller that shoots the water up the pipes. Now imagine that pump in a circuit. What pushes the current from a lower potential to a higher potential? So that is now what we will call the electric motive force. Ele sorry, electromotive force. So these uh, EMF sources come in the form of batteries, solar cells, and other devices that converts energy. So again, we already uh, determined the difference between a battery and a capacitor in the previous section. And now we will understand that it is completely different from what a capacitor is because it is a source of electromotive force, not just uh, something that stores energy. So the first thing we have to know is how to keep steady currents. And based on our understanding of the electric potential, it has to be in a closed loop. So let's recall what we learned when we talked about the electric potential. If a charge Q goes around the complete circuit and returns to its starting point, the potential energy must be the same at the end of the round trip as the beginning. So to illustrate what that means, let's look at the images below. Image A shows a wire that has an electric field E1, and it has resulted in a current density I and a current density, oh, sorry, a current I and a current density J. 
So because the positive charges are moving in the direction of the electric field, there is a buildup of positive charges on one side and negative charges on the other side. So this means that eventually both sides have equal but opposite electric fields, giving a net electric field of zero, which means the current and current density will also be zero. So you can say that the conductor will be in equilibrium as we discussed in electrostatics, the charges will, um, the, like the charges in, uh, in a plate. Yeah, in parallel plates, if you can remember that. So you can say, uh, so sorry, if we go back to that Singapore airport um, uh, waterfall, if there is no pump to bring the water up, once it falls down to the, the pond or something that catches the water, it will stay at the bottom. So that's the, the equivalent analogy for, for that one. So now, um, what do you call that water pump for, uh, for circuit? So again, I've already mentioned that it's called the electromotive force. So uh, its formal definition is the influence that makes the current flow from a lower to a higher potential. Again, because it pushes the current upstream, so it goes from a lower potential to a higher potential, okay? So one thing to note about the EMF is that it's not a force, but an energy per unit charge quantity, much like the potential. This is why the SI unit for the electromotive force is also in volts or joules per coulomb, just like the potential. So where do you see such devices that are sources of electromotive force? So again, I already mentioned that uh, batteries that power your cell phones, uh, solar cells, all devices that converts energy into electric potential energy. May it be chemical, mechanical, uh, thermal, uh, uh, thermal conductivity, uh, anything. So to further understand the purpose of the electromotive force, let's compare an open circuit and a closed circuit. So First, let's describe what's happening in the first image. We have an EMF source with a potential difference of VAB. So imagine this is a battery. And point A is the positive terminal, and point B is the negative terminal of the battery. So the positive terminal has the higher potential than the negative terminal. So let's examine the forces on one charge in the battery. So because the battery is not connected to anything, there is an equal amount of force in the direction of the higher potential and the lower potential that keeps the charges in place. So Fn is the non-electrostatic force and Fe is the one we learned in the first chapter, which is the force due to the electric field. So without Fn or the non-electrostatic force, the electrostatic force due to the electric field will act on the charge and it won't produce an EMF. It will just be a simple conductor. We can then say that Fn or the non-electrostatic force is what maintains the potential difference. So what is this non-electrostatic force? Well, this, this one actually differs depending on the mechanism in which it converts energy. So for example, in batteries, it's a chemical diffusion and electrolyte concentration. We also know in electrostatics that the electric field is pointed towards the negative potential. That's why the direction of the field inside the battery is towards the negative terminal. So this one is actually an example of an ideal source of electro elect electromotive force. So why is that? Because the potential difference is the same every time in this model. But in reality, it's not, uh, it's not, and there are some discrepancies. So, but for now, we will write the EMF, which is denoted by the cursive E as equal to the potential difference between the positive terminal and the negative terminal. So this one is what you call an ideal EMF. So let's see now what happens if you connect uh, the two terminals together with a wire. So 
this is for example you're opening a valve and the battery is the water source a current is produced and that current has an electric field moving in the opposite direction as the one inside the emf source so we already established ohm's law as b equals ir so now we write the electromotive force in uh, this ideal model as equal also to the current times the resistance. So I have stated earlier that the model where the electric electromotive force, sorry, is equivalent to the potential difference uh, as an ideal model. This means that we are not considering that, that there is a resistance coming from the source of the EMF, which we will denote here now as a small r. If the current passes through that resistor, uh, resistance r, sorry, the potential difference will be lower by a difference of ir. That's why for a real model, the potential is given by the difference between the EMF and IR, I small r, as shown in the first equa uh, equation. We call this potential difference now as the terminal voltage. So um, again, the small r is the internal resistance of the EMF. So this means that the non-electrostatic force will overpower the electrostatic force because some of the energy is used to move through that internal resistance. So let's have a real example. We have here a battery connected to a light bulb. So the battery is not connected to the light bulb. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the battery, uh, but the VA, uh, VAB and the EMF is the same. But once you connect them, the terminal voltage decreases by IR. So remember that the terminal voltage is the same as the EMF source, only if there is no current flowing through the source. Okay, so um, to uh, restate uh, that statement. So for example, you just have the battery on its own. This means uh, that the, the potential difference at the terminal or the terminal voltage is the same as the EMF. But once you connect it to the light bulb, uh, it will be different. Sorry. Uh, once you connect it to the light bulb, it will have a factor of IR, uh, which uh, factors in the internal resistance. Um, and that uh, will also change the uh, total current inside. Okay. All right. So again, if you connect it to the uh, connected to to the light bulb, uh, your current will be given by the the EMF over the uh, the resistance of the wire plus the internal resistance. Okay. So again, um, I just want to state that the EMF source is not a source of the current but it's just the valve that you open and close. So before we move on to the next part, and also because we will be talking about circuits in the next lecture, let's introduce more symbols now that we uh, will be talking about uh, when we move on to circuits and all of that. So the first symbol is just a horizontal line, which means that it's a conductor or a wire, for example, with negligible resistance. And then we have this symbol with zigzags, and that's what you call a resistor. Uh, so you get, do you get why it's a zigzag? Because uh, the, what the resistor does is it slows down the current passing through it. Uh, then we have the EMF, which is denoted by two parallel lines with one longer than the other. The longer side corresponds to the side with the higher potential, which is the positive terminal of the EMF source. We also have another version of the source of EMF, and that is the source of EMF with internal resistance R, where the R can be on any side of the EMF, as shown uh, in the pictures here. And then 
we also have a voltmeter, uh, which, which uh, you were able to use if you did the facet and ex uh, experiment in our lab class. And the ammeter, which measures the current passing uh, through the circuit. One thing to note for the voltmeter is it should ideally have an infinitely large resistance and zero current. As for the ammeter, which measures the current, an ideal um, ammeter should have zero resistance and uh, no potential difference between, uh, between the terminals, okay? So a source in an open circuit. So the figure shows uh, a source or a battery with an EMF of, uh, uh, e, oh, of 12 volts, sorry, and an internal resistance of uh, R of two ohms. So for comparison, the internal resistance of commercial uh, 12 volts uh, lead storage battery is only a few thousands of the ohm. The wires to the left of A and to the right of the ammeter A are not connected to anything. Determine the readings of the idealized voltmeter and the idealized ammeter. Okay, so in this case, uh, if you remember the if you remember the open uh, terminal here, we know that the the VAB would be would just be twelve volts, but no current will be measured because it's an open circuit. Okay, so so there is uh so the the volt uh voltmeter reading a while ago for an open circuit is just the same as the EMF of the the source. So what about a complete circuit or a closed circuit? So using the battery in the previous example, we add a four ohm resistor to form the complete circuit. What are the voltmeter and ammeter readings now? So our EMF is given by twelve volts. Our internal resistance is given by two ohms. The resistor in the circuit is given by four ohms. And we know that the, the current, uh, when there is an internal resistance given, it's just um, the EMF over the resistor plus the uh, internal resistance, which is equal to 12 volts over two plus four ohms, which is equal to one, uh, I is equal to two amperes. So this is the current that the am ammeter reads. Next, uh, for the potential difference, VAB. So that's the, the voltmeter reading. So it's just equivalent to the EMF minus the current times the internal resistance. So that means the voltmeter reading at point uh, for the potential difference between uh, points A and B is just equal to Eight volts. If you want to find the potential difference at A prime B prime, uh, that includes uh, that is um, where the resistor is in between them. Uh, you you use the idealized model of Ohm's law, which is just I R, and you still get the same answer. So therefore, V A B is just equal to V A prime B prime. So next, we have another example here. So the voltmeter and ammeter in the previous example are moved to different positions in the circuit. What are the voltmeter and ammeter readings in the situation as shown in the figures? So, all right, sorry. So in the first figure, the, the position of the ammeter and the voltmeter are switched. However, the equations remain the same and the values remain the same. So therefore, regardless of um, whether they're switched or not, the voltage also has um, zero current and uh, an infinitely large, uh, in, uh, infinitely large resistance. Whereas in the in the ammeter, it has uh, it has uh, no resistance, but there is a current passing through. So therefore, uh, the values of I and V are the same throughout the circuit. As for V, this one is different. 
because um, because the the voltmeter is only measuring the voltage from D to D prime. So this means that it will only get the voltage from the EMF source, which is 12 volts. And there's no current passing through when, uh, when, it, when there is a voltmeter connected in series. So uh, this means that the terminal voltage is V. Uh, uh, so this means, sorry, that there is no current um, that is measured by the ammeter. So the, the I is equal to zero, okay? So one thing to remember when you're measuring something, um, if you haven't done the capacitance uh, equation, you can, I'm ah, sorry, cap uh, capacitance uh, experiment, uh, you can try this, try connecting the light bulb uh, in series and in parallel for the voltmeter and see what you get. Um, but yeah, uh, if you have an electronics project to measure the, the voltage accurately, you have to connect it in parallel. Whereas the, the ammeter, you have to connect it in, a, um, in series. Uh, yeah, to get the, the correct value. Okay. So this one is an example of a short circuit. So using the same battery as in the preceding three examples, we now replace the four ohm resistor with a zero resistance conductor. So what are the meter readings now? Okay, so um, first we get the ammeter reading, which is just given by the EMF over the resistor value plus the internal resistance in the EMF source, which is just uh, 12 over two because R is equal to zero. So your current is six uh, amperes. Now, to get the, the potential difference, E is equal to I, uh, IR, where R is the internal resistance, and E, sorry, is the EMF. So that's 12 volts minus uh, six amperes times two ohms. So the potential difference is zero. So, so what does this mean? Uh, you should have an infinitely large resistance to have a voltage reading, as we have mentioned earlier. So what happens to the material? It, uh, sorry, to the circuit. So this means that the battery is connected to its ends directly. So at least this one is a 12 volt battery, but bigger batteries can actually explode if this happens. So if you have seen um, cell phone batteries that have exploded, this means that the, the chemicals have mixed together. And there are actually ways to prevent this from happening where the batteries are uh, made of films instead of solutions. So um, making it least, uh, less likely for a short circuit to happen and for it to explode. But yeah, anyway, um, this is something that, that, is, that you have to, to be cautious, uh, yeah, to be careful about, sorry. Okay, so uh, this is the last part of our discussion. So what happens to the potential energy for a charge as it travels around the circuit? So for example, we have a 12 volt battery as the EMF source, and we start with a potential of 12 volts uh, from the positive terminal. So we already mentioned this before. If a charge goes around a complete circuit and returns to its starting point, the potential energy must be the same at the end of the round trip at the beginning. So uh, when we talked about steady currents, um, that's what it means. And here we have a graphical representation of the what happens to the potential as it moves along the, uh, the circuit. Okay, so here, uh, when it when it goes out of the, I'm uh, sorry, when, when it reaches the, the internal resistance of two ohms, it, uh, the resistance, uh, sorry, the, the potential goes down by four volts. And then 
uh, as it moves uh, to, to the second resistor, it also uh, goes down by 8 volts. Going, uh, having, a, an, uh, having a potential of zero after it passes through the resistor. Okay, so um, this one uh, proves what we have, uh, our statement from the, from when we talked about the potential energy in circuits and the statement that we read a while ago. So um, that's why the equation here, if you rearrange the equation that we got uh, for the potential, so this one is just, um, if you're, if you're unfamiliar with this equation, this is just the VAB equals times IR that we have rearranged because VAB is just equal to V equals IR. So rearranging this equation. Okay, so that's how we get this equation. Okay, so last part is to test your understanding. Again, rank the following circuits in order from highest to lowest current. Number one, a 1.4 ohm resistor connected to a 1.5 volt battery that has an internal resistance of 0.1 ohms. Number two, a 1.8 ohm resistor connected to a four volt battery that has a terminal voltage of 3.6 volts, but an unknown internal resistance an unknown resistor connected to a 12 volt battery that has an internal resistance of 0.2 ohms and a terminal voltage of 11 volts. So remember the three equations that we have for, uh, first we have ohm's law V equals IR. Then we have the potential difference that is dependent on the, that where uh, the real model where there is an internal resistance involved. So that's just the EMF minus the current times the internal resistance. And we also know that the current for that real model is just given by uh, the EMF over the resistor value plus the res internal resistance. Okay, so um, with that, pause the video and try to solve and rank them yourself. And then I'll, uh, I'll show you the rankings and also the values of the current that I got. Okay, so I'm assuming that you have paused and solved and unpaused. So the first, uh, the highest, uh, the highest current is number three. And the solution I got is, uh, sorry, the answer I got is five amperes. Okay, so there is an unknown resistor. So, but it has a 12 volt battery. Uh, internal resistance and terminal voltage. So this means that you can use um, you can use this equation. Oh, sorry. This means that you can use this equation to get the current. Okay, because your uh, terminal voltage is given, your uh, EMF is given, and your internal resistance is given. Okay. So next part, number two is the second one. And I got I equals to A, okay? So unknown internal resistance, but you have uh, the, the resistor value, you have the battery um, value, and this means, ah, sorry, and also the terminal voltage. So you can just use V equals IR to get the current. Last, uh, Lee, lastly, okay, we have the first one, which is equivalent to I. So we know that there is a 1.4 ohm resistor. We know that it has a 1.5 volt battery EMF that has an internal resistance of 0.1 ohm. So you use this equation to get the current, okay? So I hope that these three equations are clear because uh, these three numbers have used um, all three of these equations, and in the next uh, in the next lecture, I will discuss the energy and power in um, energy and power in circuits, and also um, the theory of metallic conduction that is 
um, part of the, the things if you're going to have solid state physics, just a brief overview of what that means for you to understand conduction better. And I'll also give more examples for how to apply this, how to calculate for the resistivity, the conductivity, resistance, and have specific um, different types of circuits where you solve for the, the voltmeter readings and ammeter readings. So uh, you, can, you can also uh, have more exposure to, to what all of these values mean and how to calculate for them. And in your lab activities, I will also ask you to do the same. So uh, you will have practice also for that. But everything will be a virtual lab, so. Oh, sorry. Anyway, that's all for this lecture. And if you have any questions, feel free to message me. And yeah, that's, that's all for now.